Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. Several days after Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, the assailed nation's foreign minister claimed that 20,000 recruits had enlisted in the International Legion of Territorial Defense of Ukraine. A wide variety of foreign media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the BBC, ran exuberant coverage of these brave volunteers fighting on the front lines. Yet, as Seth Harp reports in the July issue, the reality he found on the ground in Ukraine didn't match the official narrative. Those who had made the journey were untrained, unaffiliated, unorganized, or assigned to safe houses until they could return home. The Ukrainian army didn't actually need them. I spoke with Harp about the wannabes and actual soldiers he encountered while writing the story, why this phantom foreign legion was manufactured in the first place, and what it's like to get stoned in a war zone. I will begin by paraphrasing Jim Carrey in Batman Forever by asking, what sort of a man has Ukraine's foreign legion on the brain? I mean, like, as your article establishes, this this is not the Lincoln Battalion or the people who joined the YPG, which you've also reported on. Well, there's two different groups there. One are the people who showed up hoping to join the International Legion, and the other are people who uh, were accepted. And now, you know, four months into the war, are for the first time being allowed into you know, actual combat operations. And those are two very different groups of people. The initial multitude that showed up at the doorstep of Ukraine at the Polish border was a very mixed bag, um, to put it mildly. There were all kinds of people from all over the world, but you know, heavily tilted towards the U.S. and, and the U.K., um, almost exclusively men. I think in the Harper's piece, I use I kind of sometimes uh, do not use gender neutral, uh, gender inclusive language for the reason that I didn't meet a single woman among the volunteers. Mm-hmm. Whereas you know, with the YPG, there were at least a few. Um, so exclusively male. One thing I noticed is that they're notably older than I would have expected. Um, you know, not not old people, but uh, old for you know, guys are showing up to fight a, a war on a volunteer basis, you know, guys in their 40s and 50s and even 60s. Um, that was one of the most noticeable macro trends in the in the guys who arrived um, in response to President Zelensky's call for, you know, every friend of Ukraine to come and we'll give you weapons, which was a pretty blanket invitation that they threw out there. Yeah. And besides that, you know, I really was, it was hard to suss out a sort of political or ideological common grounds that they all had. Most of them had seemed to have pretty generic political beliefs, you know, that it was just there to defend freedom uh, and democracy. Um, there was quite a bit of oddballs as well. Uh, some people who did really didn't seem quite cut out for the task. Um, you know, I profiled one of those guys in the piece, the, the American named Will is the one I'm referring to. So yeah, definitely a mixed bag. And you mentioned the call. And, you know, the media is a huge part of this piece. You know, it's it's part of what generated the piece, you know, headlines in the New York Times and the Washington Post um, that this foreign legion had cropped up. And there was, you know, something like 20,000 soldiers serving. Um, But when you were actually there, basically everyone you talked to who really knew what they were talking about said, you know, this was a strategy Mm -hmm. sort of to gin up support for the war. So... Why do you think Ukraine opted for this particular strategy out of anything they could have done? It may have related back to the phenomenon of Westerners volunteering for the YPG to fight ISIS, Um, because that also led to a fair amount or a lopsided amount of press coverage. Ukrainians are very media savvy, Um, you know, needless to say that they're, they're European, so they're uh, focused on you know a, a Western audience in a much more direct way than people in like Syria and Iraq are are able to be because of language and cultural barriers. Um, so it seems that they were well attuned enough and savvy enough to know that this is something that's going to result in a lot of great publicity and can only only help the the Ukrainian cause. And I think that that certainly bore out. I don't think Ukrainian needs a bunch of volunteers. Uh, they have a very large army. They have a huge surplus of a, untrained manpower. Um, but it doesn't hurt 
at all to have dozens of people from all over the world uh, embedded with the with the Ukrainian army um, and coming over and telling their stories to their local media. They're basically, you know, if you have a guy from Peru, let's say, or from Argentina, who has joined the, the International Legion in Ukraine, he's kind of, he then becomes a kind of media ambassador who's going to be subjected to interviews. And, you know, should they die in combat, then it, even more so. So I think that uh, however much foresight or, or little foresight the Ukrainians put into it, it certainly was a, a propaganda coup of, of the highest order uh, for, for them. Right. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to read, particularly at the end of your piece, you know, you close with this scene of, you know, soldiers taking photos, taking videos of bodies they've discovered. And it's like, you get a sense of that this is a very different war than, you know, something like uh, Iraq, let's say, where, you know, there's there's a green zone, there's a very controlled, uh, there was there was a real barrier between the amount of information that was coming in that was coming out, or at least, you know, towards the beginning of that war, things start, you know, technology moved around as a 20 year war, you know, things change. But this it's it's interesting to see the soldiers themselves, again, European, really knowing, you know, what sort of what to capture. I think that recording photos and taking pictures of, of dead bodies, enemy bodies, um, is pretty universal. Where I saw the, the, media, the Ukrainian media savvy most evident was in Lviv and also in Kyiv, where they had media centers that were set up to serve um, the hordes of journalists who were who are, uh, flocking to Ukraine from all over the world. Um, that certainly you would not see, in, you know, in, in Syria, you, you can't even get a hotel room. There's no, there's nowhere to stay. You, you basically just have to travel with the militia and sleep on the ground. Right. But in, in Ukraine, it's, it's much, it's much more developed country and the, the government has, has far greater capabilities. Um, and they set up something that I had never seen, which were like these centers for, um, for combat, uh, uh journalists to, to, um, hang out in basically. I mean, there was a brewery that had been converted to this purpose in Lviv um, that, you know, looked like a place that you would be hanging out in, in Brooklyn or Austin or someplace <laughs> uh, like this three story craft brewery. And it was fully set up with like great internet connections and like printers. There's all sorts of resources. There were employees there who offer help for free. They're basically like travel guides or tourist guides, daily briefings set up in front of these, um, screens that make great for great, you know, for television reporters to, to film, um, telegram, telegram channels and uh, email lists where you get their daily blasts, sometimes multiple times per day. <laughs> they had an email list? Of course, yes. And that, <laughs> all of the coverage that you've been reading from, from uh, where, wherever folks read their news, but let's just say the New York Times, I mean, that's coming directly through these channels that I'm describing. And uh, one result of that, although it is quite informative, is that you see a, a degree of homogeneity across the coverage. And to try to go outside the, those channels, I found to be practically impossible um, because I approached, you know, the, the folks who were giving the briefings or the people that ran these centers and would make requests. And they basically just, um, you know, shunt you off to the side or uh, delay. And the, the answer is, in the end is always no. So they have a very streamlined, very centralized um, media operation, and there's really no way uh, around it that I was able to find. I mean, some of the characters you meet, um, you know, you meet, you meet the head of the Azov Battalion, uh, you meet uh, different volunteers, and you also meet somebody who I was just fascinated by his title, and his name is Matthew Van Dyke. Oh, yeah. and he's a freelance military trainer. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the actual business of war, what is a freelance military trainer? And is this somebody who was invited by the Ukrainian government? Or like, what what is going on there? Mm, the, it's not unclear. I'm trying to, you know, not give just a completely cynical answer. Um and try to see it as someone like Matthew Van Dyke would see their, their role. I think Van Dyke uh, and guys like him believe that they are there to, to help. Um, and I think they, they see their role as providing a level of 
uh, expert training to military recruits in Ukraine that wouldn't be available to them otherwise. Um, but they're also just sort of inserting themselves in the center of the action. And in a lot of cases, doing this as a way to raise money. Mm-hmm. Um, so Van Dyke, for example, um, not to pick on him, but you know he has donors in the United States that fund his operations and he goes to them and will say, you know, I'm, I want to go train a platoon of uh, raw recruits in Ukraine. And you, you can imagine the sort of pitch meeting with investors and how that goes. And, so, <laughs> and ultimately, it's just kind of a vanity project. I don't know that anyone is, is going to really make a lot of money off of this. Um, and I think they kind of just want to be a part of, of the action, so to speak. Um, there is a great surplus of, of uh, unsolicited military trainers that showed up in, in Ukraine around that time. In fact, for every almost for every volunteer, there was a, someone of, of that of that nature as well. Now that, that being said, Van Dyke actually turned out to be a good source because he he was able to get access to places that, that I wasn't, um, hmm. and he had actually seen and been around um, groups of volunteers in places where you know the Ukrainians wouldn't have allowed any journalists to get near them. Um, so I don't want to come off as too ungrateful to, to Van Dyke, but um, I, 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 th- I imagine that he probably packed it up and went home pretty, pretty quickly. Well, if there is this surplus of trainers, uh, what was preventing, what was, what was the obstacle for somebody who, let's say, for whatever reasons, well-meaning, psychopathic, what have you, that show up in Ukraine, what, what was sort of preventing them from joining the front, you know, maybe not the front lines, but sort of being put to use. Uh, the Ukrainians don't need them. Um, they have a lot. They have, as I, I think I mentioned, they have one of the largest armies in Europe. Depending on how you measure it, the largest army in Europe. Um, that's you know, not. Kidding. But they're fighting Russia, right, right. the yeah. the bad guy for like a <laughs> hundred years. Like what? <laughs> well, Russia has only sent in an expeditionary force of um, you know probably significantly smaller than the total size of the Ukrainian armed forces um, and has to sustain those supply lines over a distance. So I'm not sure that Russia really has that pronounced of a, a numerical advantage over, over the Ukrainians. Um, secondly, the, the people who show up um, hoping, to, hoping to join the Ukrainian military, they're, they're a liability in many ways. Um, they're, they're limited in their ability to vet them. A lot of them, I think a big aspect of it is um, the fear of uh, infiltration and spies because Ukraine is thoroughly, um, you know, uh, uh, it's crawling with Russian spies and mm-hmm. they don't have any way of knowing that these people who are showing, probably uh, some of them are Russian spies, I would imagine. Uh, in fact, there was a, um, a, a Russian uh, volley of cruise missiles launched at a base called Yavoriv very early in the war where all of the foreign volunteers were, had been congregating and the precision uh, with which Russia carried that out strongly suggested that they knew exactly what was going on there. Um, and that kind of on the ground um, intelligence would be easy to, to obtain if you're just sent in someone posing as a freelance volunteer, takes a look around and leaves and goes and reports back to Moscow. So that's another um, problem with it. They, they don't know who exactly to trust among, among these volunteers. Um, and then, you know, a lot of them don't have military experience, don't know what they're getting into. And, um, if they get themselves killed in large numbers, it's going to be embarrassment for the Ukraine. So for the entirety of the time that I was there in March and, uh, or excuse me, the second half of March and, and all of April, uh, there were no Westerners killed in combat, which led me to believe that they were not participating in combat because, you know, if any sizable number of them had been, you know, at least one uh, would have been. It's kind of a proxy of a way to count their total participation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as far as I can tell, they were all just being sort of held back um, and either turned away, told to go home, or just kept in safe houses. They were told that the Ukrainians had no uh, rifles and no ammunition. That belief was very prevalent among the volunteers I met. And yet, uh, when I interviewed Admiral Voronchenko, who was the Inspector General of the Armed Forces, he told me that they now they have plenty of rifles and plenty, plenty of ammo. So I surmise that they're just not giving it to these people, which is pretty understandable. Um, you know, mm-hmm. the government uh, is responsible enough not to just start passing out weapons to everyone who shows up in, in Ukraine. Um, I should say that in in the months since uh, 
the article was written, it appears that they have managed to um, gather together some small groups of volunteers and deploy them into combat. There have now been uh, seven confirmed uh, casualties among the foreign volunteers. And these guys have a very clear profile because, uh, you know, it, it's unclear who's participating, who's doing this because of the way that the Ukrainians control access to the military and control access to the front lines. But when you have a certain number of people who have, who have been killed in combat and their deaths are announced, uh, that gives you a, um, some visibility on who these people are. Uh, and they're very clearly um, primarily veterans from the United States and the UK, uh, particularly people who have not just military and combat experience, but like substantial military experience, like people who have done full careers in the military, uh, who have done you know multiple tours in Iraq, who have served in special operations. That's the type of people that are that are now being chosen um, to uh, make up the the international legion as it is just now beginning to take shape. So I guess you know again going back to the Spanish Civil War, many things have changed. Obviously, since that time, war has changed significantly. So in contemporary times, how likely is the existence of an impactful volunteer-led effort? I mean, is it possible? Or is it just, you know, this, or is it simply that this situation is not conducive to, because again, they're in Europe, they're well supplied, they're well trained, they position themselves as the underdog, which is to a certain extent true, but not, maybe not enough to, to, to make you want to fly around the world and help out. I think that these sort of volunteer units are always going, going to be fundamentally ideological or propagandistic project. Um, I've never seen one, certainly not in, in my lifetime or in recent history, sizable enough to make a difference. But they do make a difference in, in terms of um, encouraging positive, uh, a, a positive reputation internationally or um, just as a way to sort of raise the morale of even the troops that are there, like say, for example, your you know, Kurdish militiamen uh, and, and militia women in particular over there. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's encouraging to see people from France or, or from Spain come, to, come all the way to Syria to, to fight ISIS alongside you. The same way if you're, Ukra if you're the Ukrainian troops who face um, really grim conditions on the front line, it's a big morale boost to see people coming from all over the world to help out. Uh, and then it projects outward as well. It makes it look like it's an international cause. It makes it look like it's a fundamentally um, ideologically based or a moral cause that would attract people from, from around the world. Um, but in terms of making a real difference on, on the battlefield, I, I don't. I don't know that uh, that uh, you'll ever see that. Even the international uh, battalion itself in the Spanish Civil War um, certainly did not. Of course, the the, the they lost their side lost, um, but they didn't. They didn't contribute much or help out at all. They. I'm not an expert on the history of the, the international battalion, but uh, I think that they had something like thirty or forty percent casualty rate. They, they got decimated. They were destroyed. Um, they never uh, won any significant victories. So, so no, I, I don't think it, it makes much of a difference in that regard. Yeah. No, I guess um, just some sort of weird macho project may not be the best way to actually win a war. <laughs> but <laughs> not so, obviously not all the Lincoln Brigade were like that. Oh, you were, well, I, yeah, they're, uh, they're certainly <laughs> could have been susceptible to some of that, that criticism. Yeah. Ernest Simeon, yeah. I think you're referring yeah. to there. <laughs> maybe maybe out of it out of anyone he comes toward the top of the list but i guess you know you've been in war zones as uh, a member of the military and also as a reporter so how do those two experiences compare uh they're very different and i was sort of able to get a foothold as a conflict reporter by telling editors that hey you know i'm a veteran of the iraq war so you can send me to syria and it'll be perfectly safe um, which is, or I would tell them, you know, I'm prepared for this, which wasn't necessarily, it sounds convincing or it sounds, you know, on first blush, like that makes sense, but really there, it, it didn't prepare me for, for it at all. Because you know, when you're in the army, you're rolling around with like 30 dudes minimum, um, anytime you leave the base, uh, and they're obviously all armed. Um, and everything you do is as part of a team. 
um, and you're typically very limited in the slice or sector that you're seeing. Um, and as a journalist, you're usually by yourself or just with a translator. And you, you, instead of looking through a pinhole, you're trying to look from above and get a big picture and go lots of different places. Um, I really, really, the only sort of way that it prepared me was in the sense that I had, you know, I had seen shootings taking place, I'd seen battles taking place, I'd been close to bombs going off before, so um, I knew that it wouldn't just completely rattle me or freak me out. Um, but besides that, there. Uh, it was more of like, uh, I hate to put it cynically, but it's almost like a, a branding thing to get uh, a foothold into, into conflict reporting is to be able to tell editors uh, yeah, that, that because I had been in the army now, I can go and like report in a country like Syria. But I think um, anybody could actually do the, the reporting. I don't think uh, you need to have had military experience at all if, that, if that's the... If there are any uh, aspiring, you know, conflict reporters listening to that, I shouldn't think it's some kind of prerequisite. Well, it's good to encourage the next generation. Um, I mean, there's a lot of humor in this piece. I mean, obviously, the idea of some guy from Delaware telling his hometown paper, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm clearing out houses. Yeah. And, and in fact, he's just like sitting on the Polish board or just like chilling at some cafe. You know, that's funny. And then there's also, you know... There's also some kind of, you know, there's images of war and what it actually means to be in war, you know, and, and you know, bullet red cards to, you know, pieces of skulls, like these, you know, what it actually means to, to kill somebody, to, to fight, to fight. And I guess, how did you balance that tone? Because I think it could be very simple to just sort of go in and be entirely dismissive or perhaps over over state one element probably most of the credit there um will go to matt sherrill my editor on the on the piece um i probably had did have some things that went too far in one direction or the other in the first draft but uh he very expertly would have smoothed those out um in general there is always a mix of humor and uh the grotesque and the very bleak uh in in war and in um, cultural and artistic representations of war, certainly you can think of many war movies uh, that that do the same thing. That uh, I think idea deserves to be explored in, in greater detail. You know, I, I can remember that I never laughed so hard in my life uh, than when I was in a platoon. You know, that was deployed to Iraq. I mean, I I can remember because it was a long time ago. I was like 19 years old. It was uh, nearly 20 years ago now. And um, I don't remember much about that deployment. Um, but I do remember that we laughed all the time. We were always laughing and joking, even though it was terrible. Uh, you know, no one wanted to be there. We all wanted to go home. Uh, we were we were in a shitty location. Um, a lot of things went wrong, et cetera. But I don't remember what was so funny or what we were always laughing about. Um, it must have something to do with, uh, with the camaraderie. It must have something to do with the pressures that war puts on people, uh, the intensity of the surrounding situations, the, the tumult uh, that's being occasioned by you know, organized violence. Um, and that probably applies in general. Probably most people that have experienced war in one way or another uh, can in some way relate to uh, the point that I think we're getting at here, but I would have to put more thought in, in that to to have a very good answer to you about what exactly is the connection between humor and war. But I do think they're very strongly intertwined in some way. Yeah, and I think even you know going back to movies about war or just horror movies in general, you know, in a horror movie you're constantly shifting between perspectives, you know. You want this person, you know, you don't, you want this person to make it, but now you kind of want them to die. And maybe something <laughs> that they said is funny because it's so ridiculous or, you know, these, these things, these sort of physical responses to the outside world, you know, the, they, they do, there is some connection there where, you know, you, you are, they're, they're not balancing each other out because that's impossible, but you're, when you're sort of keyed up when you're in sort of these fight or flight moments it is you are maybe more likely to laugh 
or to want to laugh mm-hmm. and to make it happen mm-hmm. because it get, and and also just simply because sometimes it's ridiculous. You can step back from yourself yeah. and be like, this is ridiculous. And yet I'm here mm-hmm. and I have to, you know, deal with this somehow. So instead of just falling down, I'm going to laugh. But again, I, I can't, I can't yeah. say because I, I haven't, I haven't been to war. I, I don't know. <laughs> Women are exempt. <laughs> Thank you. I think you've intuited it nevertheless. I think that the bridge between humor and horror must be absurdity. No, but, I mean, well, speaking of absurdity, what, I mean, you, you talk about it briefly in the piece, but what was it like to get high in a war zone? <laughs> and also, wow. was it good stuff or was it just sort of like <laughs> ditch weed? Like, what was going on? <laughs> um, you know... I'm from Austin, so I probably have higher standards. Uh, I can't I can't say Ukrainian weed is especially dank. Uh, breaking news here. Harvest you heard podcast. it here. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was not ditch weed. Um, as for what it was like, it was it was horrible. Frankly, um, it was just a terrible afternoon because. Um, you know, I, I did it, accepted, you know, the sort of peer pressure that they put on me to hit hit this bong um, in this sort of safe house in Kiev that I visited because I, I was trying to build camaraderie with this group and get them right. to trust me. It was a safe house where a number of foreign volunteers were, were staying. Uh, and I had already turned down, you know, the whiskey that they offered me as soon as I walked in the door. Um and I tried to take as little, uh, as a small of a hit as I could. But I, I mean, I, as soon as I did that, I had sort of guys, you know, sort of ganged up around me chanting or, or just pressuring me to, to, you know, to take it all, to take it all. That's, it's coming back to me now, this moment. This, they're sort of had this long improvised out of a, out of a wine bottle and, um, this Apishni ceramic, this classical type of, uh, Ukrainian ceramics that you see there. And so, so they would pull like that. They would like pull the wine bottle up out of the water, which would somehow draw the smoke. I'm not an expert in bomb technology. <laughs> but I remember that it was, I had to suck in all the smoke that they were insisting that I, that I um, inhale. So I did. And then exhale as quickly as I could, but very quickly it was like, you know, marijuana is a psychedelic, and so it sort of rips the bandaid off your consciousness. It makes you much more sensitive. And it was as if I, imagine like you're you're in your your office or in your home in, in New York City, if I'm not mistaken. Um, imagine if in the next second you were transported into Ukraine, and you looked around and just said, "Holy cow, I'm in Ukraine!" Because that's how I felt. Like it was like I was realizing it for the first time that I was in Ukraine. But, you know, in, in, in the middle of a war, yeah. basically, and, and the horrifying realization that, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of this terrible war. Where I mean, at that time, people were still talking about like tactical nuclear weapons being used right. in Kiev. And um, I was intensely paranoid and just struggling to hold it together. And what, what helped is that uh, I was able to just sort of reflexively go into the mode of doing interviews because that was what I was there to do. I, I wanted to interview the American kid that was there. And so even though I was really freaking out inside and just feeling very paranoid and out of place, um, I held it together enough to just ask Will these basic questions. And then soon enough, it sort of wore off and I was back to my comfortably um, desensitized, <laughs> calloused, uh, a mental state where I, you know, you can hear bombs go off and not flinch, which is a better way to be, I think, or was yeah. at that time. Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, you sort of you touch on it a bit in the piece, but I mean, you know, again, you're trying to go around these, you know, very homogenized official channels, and you know, you you talk about uh, your phone being confiscated and photos being deleted from the from your phone. I guess how close were you to the action? I mean, did you get a sense of, you know, the situation changing as you moved to different cities or was it just sort of like, you know, the same sort of given given the fact that the, you know, the Ukrainian army was actually making pretty good gains around the time that you were there? Was it just sort of the same? 
what was off limits were, so for example, when I worked in Syria, um, it wasn't easy to get to the front lines, but it was possible. You could eventually, the roads, the check, checkpoints would open up, you would make the right connections and someone would drive you up there. You could be standing behind soldiers like as they're shooting um, with, you know, shells falling at your feet. Uh, and you can, if you peek up, uh, it, it, conceivably you can see the actual enemy. Um, or walk around cities like Raqqa during the, during the battle there. That's, and that was what in particular was not, what I was not able to achieve when I was in Ukraine. Um, but because the war was such a different type of war, combined arms warfare against an adversary with an air force, with an artillery corps, um, and as well as with an armor corps, all of these things are completely different from the last 20 years that the U.S. has been involved in, um, that I was close to it in other ways. So I was in Lviv when, when, when Russia did a, uh, an airstrike on a tank factory in Lviv. So, um, you know, I was witnessing these airstrikes, uh, take place or cruise missile strikes. Um, and also in, in Kyiv, you know, the city was, although accessible and I was sort of could sort of walk more or less freely around the, the streets. Uh, there were artillery battles that were sort of raging on uh, three sides of the city. Um, and there were artillery strikes that were uh, artillery uh, impacts taking place fairly close in the city and, and even a few Russian airstrikes that they did on specific targets in the city of Kiev. So it was kind of a heterogeneous mix of exposure to, to the front. Um, and once the uh, Russians fell back and abandoned the um, offensive to take Kiev, they the Ukrainians transported journalists right up to the cities or towns uh, and suburbs um, about 24 hours after they had been uh, liberated. So we were able to see a lot of devastation that was wrought by the war, a lot of like, you know, tanks that were still smoking, um, you know, dead bodies laying uh, in the wreckage. And we were also able to talk to Ukrainian people who had just been, you know, they haven't yet taken a shower but because I guess the water supplies interrupted people. In the villages where we went to, people had not bathed in like three weeks. Um, so you're talking to people who are, who are very dirty and totally stressed out, uh, you know, to, to put it mildly. Um, so we, we were able to get that. That was the closest that I felt to, to the real, uh, to the real fighting, to the real violence that, that Russia unleashed by, by invading Ukraine was talking to people that, that had been living, um, under uh, Russian occupation for three weeks outside of Kiev. And I guess what were, did you get a sense of what that occupation was like? Aside, you know, aside from the fact that it's incredibly stressful that you're you know, there's no water. You know, this is a sensitive subject because um, the, the the villages I visited happened to be right next to Buka. I didn't go to Buka mm -hmm. myself. Um, it was kind of a, a, a random um, where people, because so many villages had just been liberated and you could kind of grab a ride to whichever one uh, was most convenient, whichever one shook out. So in Buka, where there was... Uh, what, these are terrible atrocities were committed. And I believe Nicole Tung, um, yes. photographer that publishes in Harper's, yeah, she she was there um, and recorded some of those uh, grave human rights abuses and other atrocities that the Russian forces perpetrated in Buka. And that creates a very intense media narrative around it where there's a great deal of pressure to make a great deal about what they did and, and to condemn it in the strongest terms. Um, but the reality that I experienced was, was much more mixed uh, because, you know, I obviously no love lost for the Russians. I, I would have loved nothing more than to expose Russian war crimes. I mean, that would be a great scoop for any journalist. That's what I was looking for. That's, that's some of the questions that I asked people were aimed at, you know, asking, did the, did the Russians uh, kill civilians? Did they, did they uh, rape women? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Did they steal stuff? And by and large, the people I talk, talked to in uh, Boyarka and in uh, Zabuchia just told me that the Russians left them alone, that they camped out in the forests and that they would occasionally come through town. Uh, but 
by and large, just, just left them alone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know how to account for those differences exactly, but it's not, it's not quite as, um, I think cartoonish, cartoonishly evil as you might expect to live under. There's an interesting parallel with the, with the Iraq yeah. war, um, you know, that, that, that I served in because of course there were terrible atrocities committed against Iraqi civilians, Haditha, Abu Ghraib. These things are shorthands for American military abuses now. Um, but I know for a fact that, uh, the, that the sort of default position of U.S. soldiers and commanders was to do their best to, to, to not, um, uh, to not to violate uh, the rights of, of Iraqi civilians. I mean, I'm not, that's not in no way to justify the, the Iraq war or anything about it. Total, totally opposed to that from the beginning. My point is just that, you know, anytime you have an occupation force, you're going to have soldiers that do really horrible right. things. Um, but you're also going to have in the next town over or in the next unit over a completely different experience that the civilians who are subjected to that uh, are going to go through. I guess speaking as you know, a veteran and someone who experienced the war. How do you feel like that has influenced, you know, the legacy of Iraq, the legacy of Afghanistan? How has that influenced the public's perception of war? Because I mean, do, I mean, this is sort of a way of asking, you know, you have all of these Redditors who are just ready to go fight. And are they ready to go fight because they feel like, you know, it is actually kind of easy to pick up arms and they have a sort of distorted idea about what it actually means to be at war. Oh, such a, um, that question is rich in so many potential responses. Um, all the ways in which um, the United States and our culture has metabolized the experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan, even if it's just the experience of watching it on TV. Um, I think one thing, uh, that you can draw from that is a certain, and, and this may not apply directly to the people who are on Reddit, who are volunteering, um, so much as the managers of, uh, of the U S military and diplomatic apparatus, for lack of a better word, state department, Pentagon, CIA, and the, the leading lights of the U S media establishment as well as part of that. Um, and maybe we could just say elites in general. I think there's a certain sense in which they perceive the Ukrainian uh, war, the war between Russia and Ukraine, as um, a, a salve or some way to wash away the sins of the past, a, a good war for yeah. once, one that was uh, had a clear black and white, good and bad, because who could argue that Russia is in the wrong here? I mean, say what you want about uh, NATO antagonizing Russia, which they totally did. Um, you could even say that the State Department has worked for the last eight years to, to uh, goad uh, Russia into invading. Even if that's true, it wouldn't justify what Russia did. It doesn't justify them bombing cities. It doesn't justify them encircling and laying siege to cities where millions of civilians live. So the fact that it was clearly um, a morally just cause, the Ukrainian cause of self-defense of their sovereignty, is morally just. I think that that created a kind of um, almost euphoria among uh, the uh, U.S. ruling class, mm -hmm. where this is going to be this is going to be a good war, where we're going to expiate um, the taint of uh, of Iraq and Afghanistan, much in the same way that the Persian Gulf War was perceived as doing the same with respect to Vietnam, yeah. or Iraq or Afghanistan at the beginning, you know, oh, did you know in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, mm -hmm. they make these women wear burqas and they can't even see. Mm -hmm. And it's, oh, isn't this this horror? And it's like, you know, it, it is, it is, you know, the U.S. is always kind of looking for mm -hmm. a way to mm -hmm. wash away the sins of Vietnam and, and instead just keep getting involved in more Vietnams, uh, right. which is right, unfortunate. Exactly right. But yeah. again, you can't, again, the, 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 when, when you're approaching a conflict, in a certain way, it's, it's kind of inevitable to, or, or mm -hmm. with those sort of blinders on, it's kind of inevitable to get caught up in something that's very bad. Absolutely. I mean, it, obviously you haven't been there in a while, but have you, have you heard any updates? Have you kept in touch with anybody that you, you know, were in contact with for the story? My assignment was to find out what was going on with this foreign legion, um, because 
at that time, which was only, I think, a week or 10 days into the war, there had already been like hundreds of articles yes. about it. And as I wrote in the, in the Harper's piece, most of those articles were sourced to delusional volunteers who were never going to be part of any foreign legion. And it was very unclear that there even was any uh, coherent uh, military unit, you know, with a physical flesh and blood, blood presence and some kind of base, maybe even a command structure. It was very unclear whether anything like that even existed. Um, in the month since then, I have seen some limited steps on part of the Ukrainians to put together something that could really be called a foreign legion. And I've remained in touch with the contacts that I had to see how that goes. And the big thing that I have watched to evolve is the transformation from just this horde of kind of clueless uh, malcontents of some kind or another who are coming to Ukraine to, to fight for all kinds of diverse causes, et cetera. All of the sort of um, bumbling and blackly uh, mm -hmm. comic stuff that I described in the piece, all that has sort of um, faded away as those people have gone home. And now what you're seeing are, as I mentioned earlier, you know, small numbers of um, really experienced veterans from, from in particular the U.S. and the U.K., but also other parts of, of Europe serving in the Ukrainian army and uh, dying uh, in battle and being taken a captive. Still talking about a very small number, but I think there's every reason to expect that uh, that, that will continue. And the real issue that I'm sort of watching and paying attention to, actually, I guess there's two of them um, from, from what I've seen from continuing to, to monitor the story. One is that, you know, it, it raises questions when you have, so, cause, uh, uh, I just wrote an article for, for, for Rolling Stone uh, about, uh, one particular, uh, the second American to die over there. And one of my sources sent me a photo of their squad and it's 13 guys. Uh, they're all white dudes, uh, from the U S or from England. And uh, every single one of them is a veteran of the U.S. or uh, the British mm -hmm. Army. And they've all done combat deployments. And they're all decked out in the uniform of the Ukrainian Territorial Defense Force. And they clearly look like they know what they're doing. I mean, we're not talking about a ragtag, like the ragtag leftists who over with the Kurds mm -hmm. in Syria. This is a completely different story. Um, and that picture in particular brought it home to me that the risks of having what could definitely be perceived uh, and what Russian propaganda will certainly portray as a kind of um, paramilitary or auxiliary or like filibuster force over there um, of people who have been trained by the U S and, and UK governments to fight wars and are over there in fact fighting wars. I mean, what would you think if you were on the other side of that? It's just one more way uh, in which the U S involvement in you know, what is at a geopolitical level a proxy war between NATO and right. Russia? Just another uh, indication of deepening U.S. involvement in that. It can only further pull the United States into uh, involvement in that. And for all we know, um, because I think it's always helpful if you're a reporter in the in the armed conflict, national security space, um, to have a little bit of conspiratorial paranoia about some of this stuff, because you're talking about a country that is of intense interest to. Uh, to, to the CIA and other military intelligence agencies of the United States and of other Western European countries um, who are all, without a doubt, deeply involved in activities in Ukraine. So, um, you know, that we can't prove the extent to which that overlap exists, but, you know, I think there's probably good reason to think that some does. Well, and if you were to use conspiratorial thinking, let's say, about Vietnam or the Iraq war, you would mm -hmm. be right. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, this yeah. is how Washington yeah. works, you know, and again, it's like, you For can't sure. get carried away with it. But there needs to be a healthy right. amount of skepticism. And also, you know, considering where are these places located on the map? What what possibly could be obtained? What what other sort of things besides this very foggy notion of freedom or justice is going to be obtained by mm -hmm getting involved in these conflicts. I mean, do you think that the U S mm -hmm. will become, I mean, not just sort of in a proxy way, but in a very like, I mean, we keep sending them aid, lethal aid, which is like my favorite new <laughs> phrase. Yeah. Do you think that the U S will actually deploy troops or send over, you know, more, more tangible forms of military support? 
Well, right up until the eve of the uh, invasion, uh, Ukraine was crawling with U.S. troops. I mean, I, I, there was a um, there were at least three hundred special forces and uh, Florida National Guard soldiers at the Yavoriv base. There was a JSOC base, a Joint Special Operations Command base outside of uh, Kiev, which is the most uh, covert and elite um, formation of the U.S. military, JSOC. Uh, and there were CIA programs uh, that we know of to train snipers in the Donbass. So uh, they were there right up until February 24th, or I guess it was two weeks before that, that the Biden administration announced that they were fully pulling out all uh, U.S. personnel. And, you know, I take them on their word for that, that they really did withdraw everybody. But they've done everything else to participate in the war, from providing intelligence to weapons uh, systems of, of the most sophisticated nature um, and everything in between, the full spectrum short of deploying troops. And to have this international legion that is composed, is, uh, it, it doesn't look so much like an international legion as an Anglo-American right. legion. Uh, and to have those people there taking part in conflict only further uh, blurs that line in a way that uh, I don't uh, expect would be helpful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this. This was really lovely talking to you. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to the Harper's Magazine podcast. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. Harper's Magazine is the oldest general interest monthly in America, exploring the issues that drive our national conversation through long-form narrative journalism and essays. To get 12 issues for $21.97, visit harpers.org save.